The Boston Celtics broke the record for the most NBA championships. Now they're set to do the same for the price of a team sale. Plus, NBA and NHL free agency have already seen a flurry of activity. And we'll take a look at how MLS is benefiting from Copa America and the Euros with league executive Camilo Durana. It's Tuesday, July 2nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. the Boston Celtics are ready to go out on a high note. Fresh off their championship season, the team's majority ownership group, led by Wick Grosbeck, is putting the team on the market. As a major market team now holding the record for most NBA championships, combined with a new media deal set to pour unprecedented amounts of money into the league, it's safe to say that a Celtics sale will set a league record. The sales of the Bucks and Mavericks valued those teams at $3.5 billion each, and the Suns went for $4 billion in February. Forbes valued the Celtics at $4.7 billion, fourth highest in the NBA, last October. While all of those sales happened with the knowledge that a new media rights deal was coming, the Celtics sale, assuming it happens, is likely to be the first after the deals have been signed. Whatever the final sum is, it will represent a massive return on investment for Grosbeck and partner Steve Pagliuca, who bought the team for $360 million in 2002. Sticking with the NBA, over $1 billion have been given out to players this offseason. Paul George is joining Tyrese Maxey in Philadelphia, each on new deals worth over $200 million. OG Anunoby and Cade Cunningham also joined the $200 million club with new contracts with the Knicks and Pistons, while Pascal Siakam and Emmanuel Quickly signed deals worth $189 and $175 million, respectively. You wouldn't know it from those numbers, but the new CBA is actually constraining how teams operate. The Clippers wanted to bring George back, but said that they couldn't do it while retaining the roster flexibility they would need to add role players. The team was explicit about this in its statement announcing PG's departure, noting, quote, Heading into this offseason, our roster was constructed with three great players 33 and over, two of whom could become free agents. We wanted to retain them on contracts that would allow us, under the constraints of the new CBA, to continue building the team. We negotiated for months with Paul and his representative on a contract that would make sense for both sides, and we were left far apart. Now, instead, it's the Sixers that are all in on George as the final piece of their big three. The NHL is also having its free agency bonanza on a smaller scale. The league's salary cap will rise to $88 million next season, and many stars, including former Lightning legend Steven Stamkos, have already found new homes. I'm joined now by MLS Executive Vice President Camilo Durana. Welcome, Camilo. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So we're you know making our way through the group stage of Copa America, heading toward the elimination rounds. What are you learning from this tournament that will help in two years when it comes to the World Cup, which will be in many of the same venues? In many of the same venues. You know, what, what we knew going into this was it was going to be a great trial for what's coming up ahead. As you know, we have the Copa America uh, in the United States this summer, the FIFA Club World Cup and the CONCACAF Gold Cup next summer, and then obviously the FIFA World Cup. It's been great. Undoubtedly, in these moments, soccer is in the consciousness of Americans and all North Americans more so than it is usually. So it's an opportunity for people to engage with the sport. And it's doing so really effectively, especially some of the big names. For us, it's also been great to see MLS players uh, on the world stage. We talk a lot about uh, the validation of the quality of Major League Soccer. And we've got 40 players representing our league. 21 clubs actually represented in this year's Copa America. So it's been great to see. But, but more than anything, I think just uh, you know, new viewers, the idea that there's new viewers engaging with the sport – the, the sales that we've been managing on the ticketing side have been tremendous, and there's a lot of new ticket buyers coming in and experiencing the sport for the first time. So all great signs that, that uh, uh, we'll be looking to capitalize on and, and ultimately continue to build fans of Major League Soccer. COPE is happening right now, as you might actually have you know, competition for, for MLS viewers, but are you seeing any early returns you know, with COPA and the Euros going on? Uh, in terms, like, can you quantify any of that? excitement happening right now, and especially in terms of what's splashing back on MLS? It's difficult to quantify for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, we're midstream, but we know at the end of the day that these types of moments bring new people into soccer fandom. People who go to the stadium with friends who watch the game at a bar, they learn more about the sport. And these are the types of moments where if we can get more people engaged with soccer at the end of the day, when these big events come and go, Major League Soccer is in their backyard and it's an opportunity for us to build those relationships. And it's been a proof of concept that we've built over the years very successfully, and we're excited to take advantage of it over the next cycle. 
And MLS is not pausing for, for these two major international tournaments. Is that something you might revisit in future years? You know, it, it, it's a it's an ongoing discussion because I, you know, we're part of a global game, and there's there's calendars that are set by FIFA. Confederations have their competitions. We certainly have a regular season and and uh, uh, Concacaf competitions like Leagues Cup. There's the U.S. Open Cup. So the 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 finite dates are always an ongoing discussion. In some instances, we see value in continuing to play. It alleviates pressure from other parts of the season. Um, this year we made the decision to continue to play and we'll continue to revisit those decisions as more tournaments, uh, fill it, f- uh, fall into the summer months, uh, in the middle of our season. Do you interact with, you know, the European leagues and, and FIFA and UEFA and to kind of set this, or you just kind of have to, at the end of the day, respond to what they're doing? No, there is an ongoing conversation. There are groups that represent professional leagues, that, that provide feedback on, on changes. And, and certainly there's a certain amount that is global and we're one of many leagues, hundreds of leagues out there that fall within this calendar. But within it, there's also flexibility for us to create new opportunities. A great example is Leagues Cup that we launched last year where we sat down with our partners, the Liga MX, the, the top division in Mexico. And we actually built a part of our calendar where we would pause our regular seasons and play 30 days of a World Cup style tournament which was incredibly successful for us last year. We're excited in 30 days' time, actually, to, to kick off the second edition. So while there is a certain structure that we have to fit within, there is the ability for us to change our playoff format, launch new tournaments alongside CONCACAF, like Leagues Cup, uh, and, and continue to improve our league and our product for fans. We're, you know, we're a year into Lionel Messi coming over to, to play for Inter-Miami. We're also um, you know, in, in year two of the Apple deal, uh, so, you know, it's been, you know, a, a big time of transition and growth for the league. Um, just get like a, a state of the nation on sort of how things are, you know, at, at this stage for MLS. You know, Messi's arrival was great. And we're, we were thrilled when he chose to continue uh, his career in Major League Soccer. It validates MLS as a league of choice. And there's certainly been a lot of uh, more interest from players in coming to play here. I think the important thing to remember is we, we were on track in 2023 to have a record breaking year. We were, from an attendance standpoint, from a consumer product sales standpoint, sponsorship standpoint, and then Messi arrived, which undoubtedly had a very positive effect. You fast forward to this year, we're already 12% up year over year on attendance. Our season ticket sales are up 13%. It's not just Messi driving it. 25 of our 29 clubs are up uh, year over year on attendance. So there's been unbelievable momentum. Um, you know, As I mentioned as well, players are, are considering MLS more and more. But what I'm most excited about is perhaps some of the things that we can't really quantify just yet is the impact on future generations of fans. And in my own household, I have a six-year-old that it took Lionel Messi playing in the World Cup to ignite his passion for the sport. And you're seeing that throughout the country and around, and the, and around the world. Inter-Miami CF jerseys being worn by, by people. I don't think people fully understand the impact and the legacy that his coming to Major League Soccer is going to have on our league for years. From an Apple perspective, it's really helped us be better, uh, uh, a better product and serve our fans better. As you know, we have one of the youngest, most diverse fan bases in professional sports in North America. So the Apple a, a partnership enables us to, to actually meet the, the, the needs of fans. There's 70% of them that were already streaming live sports before we did that deal. Now we have a product where a single subscription you can watch on many devices pretty much anywhere in the world, over 100 countries. And if you think about how young audiences engage, especially in urban places, they're on the go. And so the ability for them to choose to watch on their device, on television, no blackouts, uh, is a real advantage, particularly when we have different formats, live games, cut downs, highlights, et cetera. So we're really pleased with our current state of play. Yeah, and that, that Apple deal, I mean, it's another thing that's very unique in, in a major American sports in that it's, um, you, you know, you're you're really allied with, with streaming service. And now every major league wants to have at least one streaming service kind of in its, in its set of broadcasters. But usually it's, you know, you've got some over-the-air broadcasting, a, a cable partner, and a streaming partner is kind of, you know, the the icing on, on the cake, whereas in your case, it is the cake. Um I'm I'm wondering if um you know if you feel I mean of course you feel comfortable uh, with, with Apple um I, I'm just 
I, I'm wondering like how you think that decision is going to affect the league because you know you probably are going to to lose some people who might watch MLS if it was just you know uh, in in their sort of channel surfing um, uh, uh, territories um, as opposed to you know now I have to you know go on Apple TV and it's not on Netflix it's not on Amazon it's you know it's this one specific streaming service and if you're there you might run into it but otherwise you're probably not going to find it. Um, uh, I'm wondering if that kind of shapes, I mean, obviously it's a response to the kind of fan base you have, which is younger, more streaming focused anyway, but um, it's also going to shape your fan base going forward, I'd have to think. Well, I'll, I'll correct you on one point. We actually do have linear deals to complement our, our global Apple deal. So MLS games are on Fox, on TSN, RDS, and Canada. Uh, when Leagues Cup starts, you'll see games on both Fox and Univision. TSN, RDS, as well as on TV Azteca and Televisa, which are the biggest networks in Mexico. So we have a hybrid model, but at the end of the day, if you want every single MLS game, single subscription, MLS season pass, you know, certainly there's going to be people who, who are still married to their cable package and are going to struggle to make the transition. But as a whole, again, we knew 70% of our fans before we, we went into this, into this partnership, were already streaming live sports on a weekly basis. What this Apple partnership has done has actually helped us simplify the fan experience. Before Apple, we had about over 60 variations of kickoff times and days based on the fact that we were subject to linear windows. We've now shifted everything to Saturdays at 7.30, some exceptions for weekdays and a couple of games that we're doing with our linear partners on, on, uh, on early Saturdays or Sundays. But now we're, able, we're in a position where we can build habits and rituals. Uh, I've always admired what the NFL has done with Sunday. It, it is a day where people wake up. They know exactly what they're doing on that day. The ability to standardize our schedule, simplify the fan experience, is going to help us build those habits and rituals with fans. And we believe that's actually part of the reason why we're up 12% year over year in attendance because, and 13% on season tickets because you can make that commitment. You know exactly when you have to go to the game. You don't have to nav navigate around other commitments, your kids' sports. You know it's 7.30 on Saturdays. So there's a lot of push and pull and positives, but overall, we're really thrilled with the Apple partnership. And what a lot of people don't realize as well is it's much far beyond the, 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 the live games. We now have access to this ecosystem of Apple products and services. We're doing collaborations with Apple Music. We're able to integrate content from MLSsoccer.com into Apple News, which is the largest news aggregator in a number of countries, including Canada, the US, UK, uh, and Australia. So it's a world of opportunity for us far beyond the live games that we think overall has been extremely positive, uh, you know, 18 months in. And, you know, you've, you've got that working for you. You've got a very US focused international calendar. Um, can you, are you mostly just riding this wave in terms of um, the growth of the league or what else are you doing to, um, you know, to, to be prepared for, you know, 2027, when the World Cup's come and gone, Copa, the Club World Cup, Messi may have retired at that point. Um, what are you doing to set yourself up for, you know, the long term? It's not a, a single approach. We're very methodical. So, you know, over our history, we've built great soccer specific stadiums, billions invested by the owners of our clubs into building the right stadium environments where people can have the right soccer experience. And a number of things go into what's going on in stadiums, being wiring, the technology, uh, the relationships with fan groups that create some of those environments. We've made significant investments in the way we develop players, the launch of MLS Next Pro, which is essentially an under-23 league that helps player, players develop at the right time, transitioning into the first team eventually. The launch of MLS Next, which is our academy league. Um, so there's a, a lot of things going on from a media standpoint, from a product like Leagues Cup standpoint, from an environment standpoint. Um, and I think as, as we think about 24 through 27, at the end of the day, it's improved product, building direct relationships with fans in those direct relationships so that we can start to customize their experience as well. Um, so I, I don't think it's a single thing. I think we're being very thoughtful across the, the different areas that we know are gonna drive fandom and help us build that, that long-term base. There's, of course, another U.S. soccer league that, you know, is maybe experiencing a lot of these same effects, which is the USL, um, you know, it now is tier one status. Do you have a relationship with the USL or do you essentially operate in parallel? No, we, we have relationships with, with all the leagues domestic and internationally. 
Um, and I, I think the way we view it is, you know, it, it is not a, an us versus them from a, from a growth of the sport standpoint. You know, we're still in a market where there are things like the NFL, they're doing insane viewership numbers on a weekly basis. Uh, we've got leagues all around the world that are broadcasting into the territory. And you can look at it two ways. I think the way I tend to look at it is fans of soccer are a good thing, and we want people to engage with the sport. We're not at a point where we want to be dissuasive of people engaging with, with soccer. And that's why we're excited about moments like the Copa America, when millions of people travel to this country to experience it, millions go to the stadiums, broadcast is, is considerably greater numbers. Um, because people who engage with the sport, we've got a better chance of building those relationships long term and be the local option for them. Premier League will never be able to replicate that community feel and the connectivity and the relationship we have with a fan, for example, in Austin. Austin FC is always going to have that advantage. So soccer and the consciousness of Americans and Canadians for us is a positive thing. What do you think it's going to take for MLS to start bringing in, you know, obviously you've got Messi, but but more and more of that top talent to, you know, compete with La Liga, Premier League, and, you know, Bundesliga, League One, those those types. Yeah, I'll make two points. Oh, and one is we don't view fandom as singular. And it's you made this point earlier. It's not like the NFL is the NFL and there's not a lot of competition. One of the reasons we were confident and comfortable launching League's Cup is because we believe fans can be a fan of a Club America or Chivas as well as the Columbus Crew or New England Revolution. And they can have multiple clubs. They can have a Premier League club and a French League club. Um, so, so from a competition standpoint, that there is the opportunity to mix and combine, and we think we think that's positive in in many ways. In terms of of, I guess, reaching some of those numbers, it, it's a factor of time. I mean, you know, we we often get compared to some of the North American leagues, and you've got to realize they had decades head start. If you look at our history, the infrastructure built is undeniable, and what we've been able to achieve from a training facility standpoint, stadium standpoint. From a player standpoint, you could overspend. That's not a sustainable model in the short term. But if you look at the investments we've made to develop our own players, and you're seeing a lot of that proof of concept, Canada alone, uh, I believe, had, a, had has 14 MLS players on its Copa America roster, part of the 40 that I mentioned before participating in the tournament. And there's also a shift of consideration and players willing to come to Major League Soccer as part of a step in their career. At some point, Sure, we hope players will want to stay here instead of going to the Premier League, but we understand it's going to take time. But players like Tiago Almada, who had a number of options, chose uh, Atlanta United, and we're seeing more and more players make that choice because MLS is a great place to play. You have certainty. It's a great place to live, and it's a great place to develop and get playing time and continue your career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I let you go, just what are you most excited for, whether it's in Copa, the rest of the MLS season, or just – uh, for the balance of the year, what, what are you most looking forward to? Um, you know, we're experiencing an enormous amount of momentum. You know, I mentioned some of the numbers we're seeing on MLS from an attendance standpoint. Copa is going to help. Uh, but we've worked really hard on League's Cup. Uh, and and the, the the second edition of that tournament with an enhanced format, uh, I, I think the results last year with MLS winning, Mentor Miami winning the tournament and the MLS team teams uh, uh, playing extremely well. I think you'll see a, a really competitive set of League MX clubs coming to play in that tournament. I think it's going to be extremely exciting soccer for people uh, to watch. Camilo Durana, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review wherever you like to listen. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and subscribe or drop a comment there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.